Now that we've got the previous episode out of the way and you can see all the tooling modifications, the massive pile of parts that went off for heat treatment um, that are now actually present in the assembly that's behind me here, I can update you on what's transpired with that assembly over the last year or so. You might have seen it in the background of our, uh, the podcast series with Bradley Hudson where the skins were in place. Where the work is really involved is setting up the fixture and all the smaller components, the stringers that you don't see under that. And what I'm finding now is the forward 24 inches of the monocoque section, which I often refer to as the fairing, um, is absolutely filled with small parts and every one of them needs custom tooling built. Before we could even look at skinning the assembly, we had to start with the frames themselves. And uh, the big selection of parts that went over for heat treatment from our last video had come back and we fit all of those splice plates to the frames. If you remember, the frames are made of quarter sections from original manufacturer. So every one of those quarter sections needs to be spliced together. Uh, we were able to do that when the parts came back, they're all drilled and fitted, which basically makes the, each frame its own unit now. Uh, very important to do that and I'd say the most important thing before skins can be fitted was the alignment of our fixture and dialing that in so that everything is in its correct position in space to allow us to fit those skins correctly. Now, this is pretty complicated in that our fixture is designed so that it has the ability to adjust every axis that we needed to adjust to make sure everything was just spot on for each individual frame and then you have to align that one to the next one and the next one. In addition to that, the, the fixture had to be leveled. Everything had to be true to the aircraft's uh, datum. Once we had that done, it took about a week, I think, to dial this thing in. We were able to start looking at the skins. So the skins themselves had a couple specific issues with them. One being that they are approximately 147 inches long, depending on which skin you're looking at. Um, but a standard sheet is 144 inches. So when you have an extra three inches, you can't really cut the, the skin off of that sheet without going diagonally, which is what we did. But first we looked at having the sheets custom cut and uh, quite astonishingly doing that increased the cost exponentially uh, to buy the base materials to cut the sheets. So we ended up buying a big pile of sheet material and cutting every one of these skins diagonally across the sheet, leaving us with massive chunks of uh, 32 thou uh, sheet metal that can be used on other aspects of the project. And it saved us money from the initial investment. So win for us. The second thing with these skins, uh, second complication, I suppose, with them is the fact that they, they need to take the shape of the structure. I think everything that I've read, Hawker actually just laid flat panels on there, but it makes it really, really difficult. And I don't think the finished product would be quite as good. Um, the only way to roll a skin that long is really with a Farnham roller, which is a, a very large roller that's supported throughout the, the length of the roll. Uh, there is one on Vancouver Island, but we weren't able to get in there to roll these skins. What we did was a, a fairly primitive thing in that we um, I actually even rented a, uh, a steel pipe from a welding shop locally. Uh, we had a couple of diameters of steel pipe representing different radii to bend around. Um, we took our, our sheet metal blanks with a little bit of extra material on them and, and put a beam across the edges to keep them straight from being able to crease or make any issues. And we basically wrapped the skins around different diameters of pipe to get the form that we needed after spring back uh, and fit on the fuselage. So. It was a bit of an a archaic process, I guess, but it worked out really well and it really helped us for fitting the skins. Another issue with the skins is that during manufacture, Hawker uh, used these adjustable cams, uh, screw adjustable cams, to pull each one of the skins longitudinally uh, on the fixtures. And these were the quarter section fixtures uh, for the quarter panels that were then brought together. So each skin was pulled. And I think it was something like a, a 32nd of an inch of stretch that they put into that. And what I believe happened is they pulled the skin, but it only really pulled in the center of the sheet. So you ended up with a sheet that is 1 32nd of an inch longer lengthwise in the center than it is on either edge. And what that does is it gives you a compound curve. So when you go to fit these skins and you have flat sheets that have the, the primary curve on them and you suck them down to the frame, you end up with the outside edges of the skin that are too long and they start, they give you a bit of a wave. So to alleviate this and so as not to build a massive fixture to pull the skins in the center, we shrunk the skins on the outside edge. So the center is still that much longer than the outside edges and it wrapped it around and basically hugged the shape and profile of the fuselage. It worked beautifully. And uh, as you can see here, uh, you might be able to see it in the distance here. There is a bit of a compound 
just don't look at this edge because it's up a little bit. There is a little bit of a compound uh, curve to this. So it's quite a beautiful structure and hopefully we can capture it on camera better as things proceed with the actual riveting process and the Clicos aren't in your way. So the skins were on, that was a big thing. With the skins, you have to fit the stringers. There's a substantial amount of stringers here, uh, but they run from here, the transport joint, all the way up to frame A. And then they're broken at frame A and start again between A and the forward ring. So there's really no proper connection between any of the stringer segments forward of frame A. They're just basically floating in there to make the, the skin more rigid. Again, that's kind of a fairing area. Regarding the stringer sections between frame A and the transport joint that we were just at, they are connected at either end. Transport joint, they're joggled, so they're basically bent up and over, and they go over the thickness of the transport joint and rivet to that. But the forward end at um, frame A here is actually, the stringer section is terminated, it's cut off, just before the frame segment, and then they have these little brackets. I think they call them stringer caps. I'd have to look at Hawker's terminology for them. Um, but basically the uh, frame A has uh, a J shape to it, so it's got a small lip. Stringer comes up and it has to go over that J and then rivet on this side. So they've got these little guys. Um, and you can see that slot in the middle is so that it can clear the lip and then rivet onto frame A. And that rivets onto the stringer section. So that's the way they do their connection on the back side of frame A. Again, no, no connection on the forward side. One thing that we found with these little members is that, um, and a lot of other Hawker areas or Hawker structural design is minimum edge distance everywhere. And the problem with minimum edge distance is that if you ever have to repair it, you've immediately gone beyond your limits. Um, with these, we found that the original, I wanna call them cleats, the original cleats for the stringers uh, almost all had blown edge distance on them. And it's because they didn't have this. Uh, hopefully you can see that. There's a little lip that I've put on ours and it just it brings it back up and it nests neatly. Both of those feet nest neatly into that stringer. And what that does is prevent any blowing out of that edge distance on these cleats. And in addition to that, if you ever have to repair it, if you ever have a worn hole or have to go oversize on a fastener, we'll be able to do it with this one without causing any issues with limits. A problem with these cleats that I wasn't prepared for was that there's uh, four or five of them, maybe more, just a, there's a handful of them. I think there's 20 some out of these, but there's a handful of them that actually go up and this end goes on a doubler on frame A. So the plane here on the bottom has to be different from here to here. So I made a lot of special tooling to make these guys and I had to make special tooling again to make the, the modified ones that go in those special locations. So that, that's the explanation, I guess, of how these stringers are connected there. Aside from those two connections, they're only attached to the skin. They're not attached to individual frames between A and the transport joint, they're floating. With the skins and stringers done on the aft side, we then had to look at the forward side here. And as I said, th those stringer segments just float between the forward ring and frame A. Um, but it, it took a little bit of time because there's a whole bunch of them. They're all different lengths based on uh, any of the accessories that cause the stringer to have to be cut. And um, the positioning of them is critical to make sure that they're lining up with the, uh, the stringers on the aft side, but also the geometry that we're fortunate to have the engineering drawings for where Hawker actually designed them to be. So those are all done now. The forward end is uh, done stringer wise with the exception of one piece that's about six inches here. Uh, that will only take a few minutes, but is waiting for this section here, the wireless door, to be complete before I do it. 